Well guys, it's your boy Kevin Yee the Farm D, aka Kevin the Refugee, refugeehustle.com. Today I have a special guest, Tony Farm D. You might know him from the Pharmacy Podcast or Pharmacy Leaders Podcast. He actually interviewed me a while back, probably like a year or two ago. I thought it'd be cool to just flip the script and interview the interviewer. For y'all that don't know, Tony was a community pharmacist who kind of built this unique career for himself. The one thing that we can learn from Tony's story is that he wasn't really happy with community pharmacy. So he tried different things like mail order pharmacy, different realms of pharmacy. And he actually broke out using real estate. So in today's interview, we actually talk a lot about his real estate experience and how he created a fulfilling life for himself. If you guys are in pharmacy school, or you're a pharmacist who isn't really satisfied with your career, this is a video that you must watch. Hope you guys enjoy. Take care. <laughs> All right, so I guess we'll start. Are you ready? Yeah, yeah, hit me. Okay. What up guys, it's your boy, Kevin Yee, the PharmD, AKA Kevin the Refugee, and here I am leading the Pharmacy Leader Podcast. Just kidding. I have a special guest, <laughs> Tony. Uh, Tony the PharmD or Tony. How, how, what do you want to be called, Tony? Just call me Tony. But I'm Tony Farm. I, I can't get the right names. I, I did the. I did it all wrong. Like I'm Tony Farm D on YouTube. I'm Tony <laughs> underscore Farm D on Twitter. Tony Farm D one on Insta. You know, I I can't. I don't have. You know, I got all these personalities. <laughs> yeah, same here. Like all my social media is all over the place. I didn't yeah. plan it either. So, but yeah, but one of the reasons why I love Tony is because he's such an innovator for the pharmacy podcast world. He gets such like great, great guests on his podcast. And plus, you he's were my created guest. This... <laughs> I know I was for y'all that don't know. I was actually on uh, one of his podcasts and that was my first podcast ever. So um tony actually yeah that was that was great by the way but um not only that he created a really cool career for himself but you're also like you're also really financially smart too which i really want to delve into as well but um yeah tony like let's let's jump into it like how did all this sort of stuff start so you graduated pharmacy school how did you begin to start your career off well, let me actually give you a framework. I, I started yeah. thinking about this because we've had three hours since. Let's do the pot. Let's do an episode <laughs> and then let's talk to you. <laughs> oh my God. So, I know. Seriously. Like, so, you're like, let's do it tonight. And I was like, okay, well, I'm let's down. Go. I'm yeah. down. But yeah. no, it, it was so clear what I wanted to talk about. And because you've been out, what, five years? Is that right? About Six five years? or four years. Five, four years now. Yeah. So I've been out 20. And that's not necessarily oh, better, <laughs> especially in this uh, environment. But I think there's four different places you end up. You either end up working for somebody, you mm -hmm. end up working for yourself, you end up teaching people to work for somebody, or you end up teaching people to work for themselves. And mm -hmm. I've gotten to do all four. So I thought that, you know, we'd kind of talk about those four and, and the benefits and some of the downsides of each of them. But yeah. Uh, like you said, what I started was uh, I worked at Walgreens in Arizona for four years uh, back in the golden age. You know, they di I didn't get a BMW, but, you know, I asked, you know, it's like, uh, you know, what store do you want? You know, so you can get full time at a single store right away. Uh, mm -hmm. You have a lot of flexibility. Um, so it was really good back then. But let's mm -hmm. just start with that and kind of talk about some of the good things we can do with retail and some of the things that maybe uh, we want to avoid. No lie, as you're talking about like the four different types, I'm thinking about Rich Dad Poor Dad off the top of my head. As you're he like lives going through in Arizona, each man, he lives in, in uh, <laughs> Phoenix in the rich middle middle of the uh, middle of Phoenix. So, did did you read that book, by the way? Oh yeah, my dad actually gave it to me. My dad's an immigrant, mm. and he's mm. uh, like an immigrant. He wanted his son to do better, so he's like, "Here's this book. You should read it. It's gonna it's gonna make you succeed." And he was right. Mm mm mm. Yeah. Um, so back, back to your, uh, I guess, Walgreens story. Like, how did you end up there? Um, I wanted to get out of Baltimore. I'd been in the city too long and there were actually not a lot of jobs because the pencil, there were so many Pennsylvania schools sending students down or graduates down to Maryland that I started looking elsewhere. And then, um, I don't know. I just went out there for one of my APPE rotations and I was going to go to California 
but <laughs> I didn't want to take the risk of maybe I could pass the California boards or maybe I couldn't because that yeah. was back when it was California boards uh, yeah. you know, 20 years ago. And, and I don't know, I kind of fell in love with Tempe and Phoenix and, and it was just, it was kind of like East, East, East uh, LA. So uh, it was just kind of California in, in the desert. And so that's why I ended up there. But yeah, just uh, kind of called Walgreens up and they were hiring, uh, they were expanding and there were just lots of jobs. Back then, were there like a lot of like clinical opportunities as well? Was that like starting to be become up and coming? Not really. Uh, yeah. We actually felt like posers, to be honest. Uh, <laughs> we, we still called them the real PharmDs back then. So the real yeah. PharmDs had two years of PharmD post bachelors. And mm -hmm. these guys were the top 20% of the class where mm -hmm. now they kind of said, all right, now all of you guys are PharmDs. And it mm -hmm. just kind of seemed like, well, we didn't want to be PharmDs. We just wanted to go manage a, a retail store or, or something like that. And we didn't really have a choice. So... I think the opportunities were there still for that 20% um, mm -hmm. and it, it, people became more aware of it, but I don't know. I just wasn't looking for it. So I, I didn't see it. So it might've been there. I don't, I don't, but I just wasn't interested in it. Mm. Um, tell me about your experience, like with retail pharmacy, did you like it? Did you hate it? What were some of the things that you, what were some of the things that you both enjoyed and disliked about it? Um, I think I, I tried to like it. And mm -hmm. that was, and I really tried. So I, I worked 32 hours, so I didn't burn myself out. Uh, and I started there at Walgreens and I, and I loved Walgreens. They were great. I mean, you know, you're hiring a guy out of school and you're paying them that much. So I, you know, I thank them for the time I had with them. I tried mm -hmm. overnights. Uh, I tried managing a store and that wasn't for Walgreens, that was for Albertsons. And I tried yeah. mail. Order. And for four years, I just never felt like like I was moving forward and I think when you go to school for 18 years you keep learning every year and then all of a sudden yeah. you don't learn a ton you know mm -hmm. it's just unsatisfying so then I went home to Maryland and I thought that would be it but uh, no uh, retail never really stuck and so I started real estate we won't talk about that quite yet but I started the real estate thing and then eventually just left retail about seven or eight years out of school and mm -hmm. I haven't I haven't worked uh, as a full-time pharmacist since yeah, but you're still definitely involved with the pharmacy community for sure. Oh, yeah. I, I like to promote other people and help them out. But uh, a job where I can't really be creative and create things like the stuff we're doing now, uh, mm -hmm. that just wasn't for me. Just just curious. Were you always like really creative when you're a lot younger, when you're like a child, when you're in high school and all that? Were you always creative previously? Um, I might have been, but... Uh, they thought me, they thought I was lazy because I got really good test scores, but I didn't do really well in the classroom. Uh, mm -hmm. I struggled with hearing in one of my ears and I also struggled with distraction. I don't know if I have ADHD or something like that, but, mm -hmm. uh, I just was never, it's tough to get recommendations from a teacher when you've got low grades, but you've got really high SATs. So that's how I managed to get into pharmacy school. I got a perfect score on the PCAT. Um, and I, Whoa. you know, did really well on SATs, but, uh, they're like s trying to ask it in a nice way, but I barely had a three Oh getting in. So oh, wow. it's, it's a tough road uh, for me. Cause I, I really struggle in the classroom and in a sit down classroom In labs, I did fine where it's kinesthetic, mm. but just sitting in a lecture, I couldn't do it. Mm -hmm. I see. Wow. sounds like you're like, uh, like you're a really good test taker, but just in the classroom, you're just like like you just didn't have the grades and stuff no no i just didn't i didn't have the interest either like it just yeah uh, I, but i showed up every day so that was that was important uh but uh whether i i was writing about that class or not no but uh mm -hmm. yeah so but that that was so you've got a bad student making a lot of money anyway so it's still yeah. it still worked out but uh no the, to answer your question no i really wasn't satisfied with retail and i i kind of was looking for something else Mm -mm -mm. Wait, um, just to backtrack a little bit, what even got you into pharmacy to begin with? Um, my my classes just worked out for pharmacy. I thought med oh. school, and then I was actually like any pre med, you have to have some kind of experience. So I got experience in the pharmacy, and I just mm -hmm. was like, well, I actually like this. Um, <laughs> I think I might like this better. And then when I really thought about it, uh, it was. 
I wanted to be a doctor or I wanted to be thought of as a doctor. I wanted that prestige. Uh, and I come from first generation, so my dad's an immigrant, and so that was a big deal to be a doctor mm. of some kind. But uh, I think it, it was more like, wow, this is really what I want. Because all I knew about medicine was what I saw on TV. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so when we when we talked about your, like I guess, community pharmacy experience and whatnot, um, how did you know it wasn't like really for you? How did you know that you weren't really feeling it at all? I hated going to work every morning. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I could make it. I mean, I wish I had a story, but like I got in the car and I just like it was just like I, I just let a breath out like, <sighs> all right, let's do it. <laughs> So and I, and I I had loans just like everybody else. They weren't ginormous like they are these days, but but I don't know. I just didn't really I didn't really have any other plan, so I just went to work. Oh wow. Yeah. So what did you start doing like as um like when you realized that hey, maybe this wasn't for you? Like what did what kind of things did you do? I know you said real estate and whatnot, but what other type of things did you start looking at? when you realize that um i went to arizona state while i was going to school because i thought i'd be a writer and <laughs> um then i found out what journalists make it was about a quarter of what i was making uh mm. so i could have worked like i probably could have worked like 16 hours a week as a pharmacist to make what a journalist did and that was fun but i didn't i didn't know how to be an entrepreneur i didn't have a mentor and um we didn't have the internet really too much back then either. So I didn't really have a Gary V to go to or those kinds of things. Tim Ferriss. Yeah. I, I, there was nothing like that. There was rich dad in book form. Oh my God. Imagine like, <laughs> we're going so old school, <laughs> dude. When I, when I hear like rich dad and stuff, like I love that book by the way, but some of the stuff in it, um, that man, if that was the only resource that you had, Oh my God. I can't even imagine. I'm sure there are other resources. I just, I didn't do a yeah. very good job looking for him. Yeah. Um, so what's your next step after, uh, so you went to Arizona state to try to pursue writing, realized that wasn't for you. What was your next step after that? Well, I went home and I think coming home was the best thing that I ever did. Uh, and I started the real estate thing only because I was in a retail pharmacy and something was going on with my knee and now I know it was my IT band. I was just standing 12 hours a day and it, it was pulling on my knee and I thought I had some kind of arthritis that, you know, rheumatoid or something like that. And I didn't, but I thought it was going to, I thought I was going to lose my career. So mm. that fear pushed me into getting the real estate license, but there's a big difference between getting your license and learning how to do the job. And that took coaching. So that was really where, that's where I learned how to become a business person is getting coached by Buffini and company down in Carlsbad, California. Uh, Buffini company. Yeah. So they're a real estate and they, they coach real estate uh, and lenders and it's about 400 a month, I think for the full coaching one-on-one. -on -one. Mm -hmm. And this guy, you know, had made millions of dollars uh, as a San Diego realtor, but he was really good at teaching you how to do it too. And he figured out these five circles of life, so spiritual, family, business, finance, and personal. And if you could get those right and get coached every couple of weeks, uh, it would work out. So I went from making 5000 my first year to 253000 my last year of uh, real estate. Holy shit. So five shit. years later. Yeah, that so I was making crazy. a quarter of a million. Yeah, I had to leave the the – I left pharmacy because it just it, it just didn't really pay very good at fifty dollars an hour or whatever it was. So my time yeah. wasn't my time was worth closer to two hundred an hour back then. Oh wow! So wow, that's so crazy. So <laughs> wow! So you like, dude? I'm just like really shocked because you're just saying I made five thousand my first year, and then a year later I made two hundred. No, no, not not oh. a year. Sorry, I, I misspoke. Four years later, five years later. Oh, gotcha. I brought in two hundred fifty-three thousand in, in gross commissions off ten million in sales. Mm. How how much time were you putting in roughly a week, like with coaching and the actual work behind? The coaching is only thirty minutes every two every two uh, every two weeks, so mm. it's not getting a ton of coaching. It was just the system, and the mm. system was just so good 
you it literally was just making calls, writing notes, uh, popping by your clients, having client parties. But the key to the whole system is building contact, care, and community. So you're in yeah. touch with your your clients, uh, you're caring for them, and then you're building community. And so we didn't have Facebook groups back then, but it was <laughs> kind of like that. And I, dude, everything's starting to make sense now because I look up to you and I'm like, dang, look this, look at this master connector. And I was like, oh, now <laughs> like it kind of makes sense. You had practice years before. coaching. Yeah, that wasn't. <laughs> this is not a beer, by the way. That that sound, that's a Red Bull. So, <laughs> <laughs> dude, that's crazy. Um, wait. So when you um, so did like when you first got into it, did you struggle a lot? Like, did you? I was, was terrible. Any- I oh sold my, my girlfriend's house, and that was the only thing I did that year. So. <laughs> <laughs> what I didn't well, know uh, what I was doing. Oh my god, was it like the pitch and stuff that you're like talking to people, or you just had no experience with like selling selling properties and what? Yeah, so it's it's so that's a good uh, point you're making. It, it's not about selling property; it's about no? making relationships with people that you're Mm -hmm. their first person to call Mm -hmm. and i didn't know how to make relationships with people in a business sense without being Mm -hmm. inauthentic and as pharmacists i think we have trouble taking money especially for business things Uh, Mm -hmm. and so i learning to be authentic in helping people is what really helped me out but 95 percent of my client base was a pharmacist or a referral from a pharmacist I didn't mm-hmm. advertise at all. It was all by referral. Oh wow, that's yes. Yeah, so there would have been. I would have done no Facebook ads, no Insta ads, no Twitter, nothing. Just you should call this guy if you're selling a house. But I think that's like honestly one of the best ways to best ways to build trust with other people through referral. Like I've been so I've been studying a lot of like Facebook ads and affiliate marketing and stuff. And you'd be surprised. A lot of people actually burn through a lot of money just trying to go through Facebook ads all the time. Yeah, no, I, I, I still believe in contact care and community. If you can build a community, you can build mm-hmm. a business, but most people try to build the business first. You got to build the community mm-hmm. first. You just haven't so, monetized yours, but you got a ton of, you got a ton <laughs> of love in your community and just a really loyal following. Yeah, I know. I'm just so grateful that I have so many people that really, really care. But let me ask you this. How do you go about forming your community and showing people that you really care and creating that that trust, you know, be, between people? So it's kind of cliche, but with the podcast, I really could. I'm I'm not doing it for any money. Actually, I don't make any money off the podcast. I make money off my books if people buy them. Mm-hmm. But uh, I'm just really interested in what they have to say. And I'm interested in promoting students because I think there's going to be students, especially this year, uh, and especially in certain parts of the country. You're in California, one of the five best states to be a pharmacist and one of the five best states to get a job this year. But mm-hmm. there are going to be students in other parts of the country where maybe there's, I don't know, six pharmacy schools all of a sudden. And they didn't do that. It's not their fault. Yeah. When they were coming in four years ago, two of those schools might not even been there. And so they're they're going into a challenge that they're going to have to learn how to get a job with their farm D, and not necessarily in a pharmacy. And mm. I think that's going to be that's the one challenge I really want to help them with is help them do that. And the best way to do it is to do what you're doing. What hopefully I'm doing is getting stories from people that are succeeding, and then they can learn from those stories. Mm. Yeah, I definitely relate to that challenge too because. I mean, there is a reason why I'm in California was because I couldn't find a job back home in Boston because literally there's like four and now I think five schools pumping out pharmacy Mm -hmm. students every single year. And it's not a very big state. It's not like California where it's like, you know, (laughs) along the coast, right? It's a small, small state. So I was competing against all these people and I couldn't find a job out there. Yeah. Anyways, um, so we talked about sort of two of the quadrants that you're talking about. And then what was the other quadrant that you were like hinting at before getting into teaching? I think a lot of people want to either Mm. coach or mentor or teach and Mm. um, they want to do that right away. And people will tell you, maybe you should wait a little bit. But what I did was I taught as a middle school science teacher, uh, just a substitute teacher. I taught for Kaplan uh, and I taught as an adjunct professor. So by having experience in teaching, eventually I got a full time job teaching. 
But mm-hmm. I think what what really the value in the teaching is is not only the the relationships that you have with the students, but you have so much autonomy. Mm-hmm. My dean doesn't. My dean just says this is what you need to do, and he never really says this is how you have to do it. And it's just so refreshing to come into work and know that it's up to me. So I actually work more hours than I ever did uh, as a retail pharmacist, being given the freedom to do things the way that I want to do them. But I think the one thing that we really, really all seek is to make a difference in other people's lives and to uh, to have the autonomy to do it when we want to on a schedule that that isn't going to make things tough for you know our family. Yeah, I think that's one of my biggest like worries, actually, Um, when I first jumped into retail pharmacy or community pharmacy, I was just like, man, I can't imagine having like kids and being a good father and balancing all these like sort of things all at once, you know, especially with the long hours of work, the holidays and stuff like that. Um, It's it's tough, you know. Kids are understanding to some point, but there Mm -hmm. is some point where. Uh, They'll say, why is dad never here for this? Or why is mom never here for this? My kids have actually said that uh, Mm -hmm. sometimes when, uh, uh, because my wife has to do the nine to five, so she can't go to their day things. And I just tell them it's because daddy's not making enough money. If daddy made enough money, mommy wouldn't have to work and she could go. So then my daughter's like, well, daddy, you just need to get another job. (laughs) 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 So, you know, your, your kids have a lot of wisdom and, and, you know, I, I think instead of thinking of it like, okay, I've got this retail job for 50 years, just think, all right, well, this fits me for my early 20s, but let me make sure that I got something going on for my next, you know, late 20s, early 30s. Yeah, like sort of building an asset that's that keeps on growing and whatnot. Yeah. Because mm. so, I think Brian uh, Fox is doing that now. I think he's kind of doing for the future because he doesn't need another degree but he's got a great job but i think he's thinking all right well maybe down the line i'm going to need some more flexibility so what he's doing with his mph i think is getting more flexibility what i think you're doing with your entrepreneurship is hopefully getting more flexibility yeah hopefully um you know it's been um i think that's one thing that me and brian talk a lot about you know like financially and whatnot we don't we don't need to pursue youtube actually YouTube and all these other social media things takes a lot of time away, but it gives us a strong purpose and sense of giving to the community, like knowing that so many people watch us and watch you guys, watch you as well. Um, it's just very rewarding, you know? No, absolutely. And, uh, yeah. I remember the first time like Brian got recognized and I was there with him. I was like, man, this is so awesome. Like I get to see <laughs> Brian, like, like get all like, um, you know, f- like, so see i we got to see some girl like fan, uh fangirl over him it was really funny dude <laughs> i i haven't actually i have had that happen a couple times all right so i'm, I'm not but it, it's not it's rare it's not like I'm, I'm walking down the street and like oh my god that's the guy from the pharmacy leaders podcast no i gotta do, do you get, video <laughs> do you get a lot of like um like emails and stuff people thanking you for like your podcast and whatnot as well Every once in a while, I get the thank yous, but mostly it's for advice. It's uh, guys that are my age or older that are uh, gotten pushed out of a job or uh, mm-hmm. don't know what to do next. And they're like, well, should I go get my farm D or should I do this? And uh, I, I kind of feel for them. But most of the questions I get are, are advice about career or advice about school. Yeah, I think your advice is actually really sound because um, even I, I'm guilty of it. Like sometimes we'll say certain things, but you like like we'll say certain things like the job market is saturated but how do we know that and i think you actually published a really good article that I actually read and it made me think well is this true and then you had like resources to actually find out um like you you, ha- you post up resources where you can actually find out whether your area is saturated or not what terms to search yeah. up i thought it was a great i thought that was a great um way to approach things you know i just and talked it, to my best man be- he works in uh, Southern Arizona and he's he's making more money than he ever has. So if you're in the right region of the country, there's a need for mm-hmm. pharmacists. But if you're place bound with one or two people, like maybe you and your, my wife and I are both pharmacists. So mm-hmm. if we both had to move somewhere together, that might be a, a little bit tough. But um, mm-hmm. I, I know there's gonna be struggles for a lot of people, but there are 
jobs out there I'm hearing. So I'm hearing both sides. And I, I mm. wrote that article you're talking about on purpose that way because I didn't want to mm. say, here it is again. Here's the, you know, oversupply. So I just wanted to give them some tools. Doom and gloom. <laughs> Mm -hmm. I feel like there's a lot of that, you know, especially like when I talk to a lot of students, a lot of them feel so uncertain about like finding a job or like a career and the, uh, half the questions I get and the videos that perform the best are always like, it, will there be a job for me after I graduate and whatnot? Well, there's a 96% employment rate in this country, so mm -hmm. they could be in another country. It'd be terrible. So I'm just fortunate that my dad decided to come from Peru and come here. And, and I just have all kinds of opportunity, whether or not I'm working in a pharmacy, there's plenty of jobs. What I think they're, the students are really saying is, look, I got $300,000 in debt mm -hmm. and I was expecting to make a job that had this much money to start. And now I'm going to get a job that pays 40,000 to start or 50,000 mm. if I can't get this pharmacy job and they don't know how to deal with that. So I think mm. that's that's the solution we need to help them with. How, how do you help a student with that or what solutions do you think are actually, um, that would help a student in that situation? Well, first the, the government recognizes, and I'm not the year financial pharmacist guy, that'd be the guy to talk to about this, <laughs> but, but I know that the government recognizes your income and mm. says, if you can't pay because of your income, then, you know, we, we adjust your loans or you can extend it and do a bunch of different things. So I don't know exactly what those things are, but, mm -hmm. and you can defer them by staying in school. And so there's a lot of different solutions, but I think the, the key is to really figure out what, what you have in debt and then figure out, all right, well, what do I actually need to make? And maybe you have to work two jobs to make what you need, but it's not always going to be tough like that. It'll get better. Mm. Yeah. Or uh, throw all your eggs in one basket and go into cryptocurrency and just pray. <laughs> yeah, should have just, uh, if I just bought 10,000 Bitcoin at $1. <sighs> then then 300,000 wouldn't be a problem, right? <laughs> <laughs> I would have been, that would have been a rounding error. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and uh, the fourth thing that you're talking about, like uh, the four things, what was that one again? I can't remember. Oh, okay. So I think this is where people really jump into it maybe a little early is they want to help other people be entrepreneurs when uh -huh. they haven't really gotten their house in order. And yeah. I think, uh, I don't know, I, every writer I've talked to, every entrepreneur I've talked to, they're like, you've got a job and you're an entrepreneur, man, don't get rid of that job. Just don't yeah. do it. So I, I think that um, I had Dr. David Draginas, who was an anesthesiologist down in Texas, and he mm -hmm. had a good episode. And he basically brought an entrepreneur on that said, look, you want to invest in entrepreneurial ventures that you think are going to go. But if you're the actual guy, entrepreneurs are guys that work 80 hours so they don't for themselves so they don't have to work 40 hours for someone else. Yeah. But that, that glamour on Shark Tank – that's not how it is for most people. So I think with entrepreneurship, helping other people, I think it'd be better to to work with other people, network with other people. I think that too many of us kind of go get our own job after school when it would be better if we kind of did it as a group. Like, hey, let's go move to Arizona together or let's move to part of Cali together or whatever it is and stay as a group and kind of, you know, take on life's challenges after graduation as a group instead of just as a, all right, well, I got my job. Good luck. I hope you got one too. Yeah. Rather than like, uh, like individually, I, I, I totally get you kind of like a mastermind. You know, what's really interesting. I was actually talking to a venture capitalist. Like I, I randomly met through my pharmacy friend and he was telling me like, Dude, you and your pharmacy friends should really click up so you can buy property and whatnot and sell sell commercial real estate and whatnot. I don't really want to do real estate, but mm -hmm. that got me thinking, you're right. You know, so often we think we have to do everything by ourselves, but really we have this pharmacy school is one of the best ways to build relationships, honestly. And we can always click up and help each other rather than just always focus on ourselves, which I think you bring up a great point. Yeah. So I think that, you know, if there was one piece of advice that, you know, how you kind of work towards a thesis, I think the, the best advice is that uh, you should take on these challenges in groups uh, and mm -hmm. you should mastermind. And, and I think people think of a mastermind as being like a dozen people or two dozen people. 
it can be two or three or four people. You've got Engineer Truth, who's got amazing advice. You've got Brian Fung, who has a what doesn't he have like a resident to the right and a resident to the left? He has kind of this panel. Uh, so yeah, you just got some great guys in your network. Yeah, I like. It's so funny because all those came like very, all those relationships came very organically, you know, and I didn't even really have to try hard, but we just had very similar mindsets, you know? Yeah. I've never met most of the people that I've podcasted with and mm -hmm. the guy that has the pharmacy podcast, I've never met him like in person. Oh, really? And I've been working w with him for like two or three years now. <laughs> yeah. I've never met him in person. Everything. And that happened through Twitter. So oh that God. old thing, Twitter. <laughs> I dude, I don't even use Twitter. <laughs> I know, I know you don't. So it's uh, yeah, yeah. But I, I'm I'm learning Insta. So you know, I got seven thousand followers on Twitter and two hundred on Insta. So I've I've got some work to do. <laughs> dude, Insta is really hard if you're not a girl, honestly. <laughs> dude, half the trending. Nice no, I feel better about myself. <laughs> yeah, so you just gotta post up all your female uh, guests on uh, your pharmacy podcast, and you're good. <laughs> I told you, man, I gotta do video, not audio. That's my problem. <laughs> but honestly, I actually really admire you for actually jumping into social media like so late into the game and whatnot. Yeah, I'm just about to. Yeah. <laughs> 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 you're old man you're 45 and <laughs> low key low key saying you're old and whatnot but seriously i know a lot of people like after a certain age they just like they just kind of tune out and clock out they don't want to learn any of the new stuff but i really admire you for always like trying to get involved with social media i appreciate that but it's it's actually kind of with some of the stuff that you've been really transparent about like when things are going bad for you you're really transparent and talk to your group and your you're following and every once in a while you've talked about kind of a loneliness or isolation um mm. in pharmacy i think there's a ton of that isolation there's a song and this guy is going to be singing in nashville but it's alone in a crowded room and sometimes yeah. you just feel alone in a crowded room and or alone in a crowded pharmacy and so mm -hmm. by talking to these people i and by talking to you i always feel better like i always feel <laughs> just a little bit of a you know a little bit of I don't know. My wife's like, oh, did you go talk to some adults? I was like, yeah, you know, it's good because I'm usually talking to six year olds. So, <laughs> <laughs> but I'm telling you, pharmacy's isolating and, and uh, being on the podcast, talking to these uh, entrepreneurs, talking to these leaders, it's just refreshing and it just, just makes me feel like I'm, I'm part of a community again. <clears throat> Out of all the guests that you had on your podcast and whatnot, um, what, what are some of the most memorable interviews that you've had? Kevin Yee. <laughs> Shameless plug. Check it out right here. No. <laughs> Kevin Yee went from managed to make it from explicit to non-explicit. That was a big jump. <laughs> yeah, I know. Oh my god. That was that was really, really, really hard. I was trying really hard not to swear on your podcast. Um actually the, the most impactful interview is the one that's coming Wednesday. We're talking on Monday, January twenty second. Uh, mm -hmm. I broke Nancy Alvarez's episode into two episodes because it went about 45 minutes. And oh, wow. to just give you a preview of what, what uh, was going on with that, she uh, she said that her the, – the advice, you know, now that she's APHA president, she had this really – I don't want to say epiphany, but she was able to really be concrete about this. And she said, you want to be present because the emails will still be there, but the people may not or something to that effect. And I don't – mm -hmm. I'm – blowing up the quote but basically that so many times the people that matter were you know were like oh i filled 600 prescriptions today but then you didn't spend time with your kid or you know i answered all these emails and i got all this done but then mm -hmm. you know you missed out on something with one of your buddies and mm -hmm. and so you know the a national leader like her saying look i'm learning to be present under the tremendous stress of being you know the APHA president and the amazing amount of you know emails I'm sure that she gets and calls and everything and if she can be present then it's important that I be present too mm -mm -mm. that's that's so important and it's actually a lesson that I'm sort of really learning right now 
um especially when you're young you're a young pharmacist straight out of school you're always like <laughs> like fuck it i'll work overtime i don't care or like there you know go. like we're up <laughs> <laughs> or like i'll work holidays you know but then especially with my dad's recent passing i just realized that you know i could have spent a lot more like the people around us they might not be here one day or they might need us one day but we're not there you know and I think there's no amount of money that can re replace that, those moments, you know, or Take compensate for those. That's great that, you know, even as the, as her world is like so busy and whatnot, she takes the time to, to really reflect on that. All right. Oh, dude, we got, we got into such a deep convo. Um, yeah, so the fourth, go, go so deep. Oh my God. <laughs> Let's go back to thing. money. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Money. Yeah. So. Well, yeah, why don't we talk about money for a second? Because I feel like that's a huge thing for a lot of pharmacists. We have this huge uh, amount of debt. If you were to like do, let's say you just graduated 2018. Mm -hmm. You just graduated. What would you do if you were like dropped with 200K of debt? Um, and how would you go? What would your strategy be paying it all back? Or like if you were to do your career all over again, what would you do? Well, I'll tell you exactly what I did when I had less debt than that, but it sort mm -hmm. of was an equivalent. Uh, I never left college because mm -hmm. it kept deferring. So the debt was never a thing that – so I, my debt never actually impacted my decisions on career because mm -hmm. I never actually started paying it until I just paid it off at once. And so mm -hmm. the real estate business got so good that – I just got frustrated one day and just wrote a check for the entire amount and paid it off. And then two years ago, my wife's like, hey, I still got 25 grand. I'm like, fine. So I paid her 25,000 off for Christmas. And I was just anyway, but but to, to answer your question, so let's say I graduate and I got 200,000 in debt and I'm faced with two choices. I can either start taking on this debt and start paying it down and start making decisions based on that debt and let that debt control me, or I can push off the debt and mm. maybe defer it in some way and then start continue to work in things that I want. And I think it's more important. I, I think you can still do this. I, I did it with community college. I took six credits at community college in fall and spring and I deferred my debt and I didn't have to pay any of it. Um, but what it did was it allowed me to keep exploring things that I cared about. And because I was doing work that I cared about, it didn't feel like work. So it was easy to do 60 and 80 hours. When you're doing work you hate and you're trying to pay off a debt you don't want, it's such an uphill climb. But if you're doing yeah. work that you love, you can work three jobs and you'll pay it off a lot faster, I think. So making mm -hmm. sure that your debt doesn't, making sure that your debt doesn't drive you but that you drive around your debt somehow. Hmm. I think that's a very important point to make because like, I think uh, for me, I see both worlds, you know, um, for me, I have always like, I always thought about my school debt and like doing community pharmacy. I don't always necessarily enjoy it, but when I'm on the YouTube side, dude, I could do that forever. <laughs> it's one of the reasons why I'm like so energetic on camera. It's one of the reasons yeah. why like, like, dude, I could do this forever, you know, but yeah, yeah I, I definitely, mean, I, I, I got up at 445 to go work out this morning and now it's, I don't know what time it is. What time is it? 915. And then I'm going to do another and I'll get back up at 445 tomorrow morning. I got a podcast episode. I'm recording at 830 tomorrow morning. And so maybe that's the advice we should be giving too, is that mm -hmm. if you want to keep your energy up, make sure there are things like this that you love to do as part of every one of your days or at least every other day. Yeah. I think that's so important because just like you, well, I follow, uh, this, this, uh, Navy SEAL Jocko Willink. And ever since I started watching his, uh, podcast and stuff, I've been waking up at like 4am as well. But like you give like when you wake up that early and you have something to look forward to either working out or working on your business or whatever whatever makes you really really happy to wake up dude i just realized that i was just so much my life felt so much more fulfilled you know yeah well i mean there's a monetary side to it i'm talking to mm -hmm. my podcast mastermind group tomorrow and it's just one person right now and she uh she brought in 30 million worth of sales 
So on 30 million worth of sales, you're talking about eight or nine million in commissions a year out of San Fran. So, um, you know, you'd be amazed at at the, you you would just be amazed at how much people make when they don't know, like they don't have limits like 100,000 or 150,000 on their mind. Mm, 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 mm. Yeah, that's true. And I think that's like one of the appeals of like entrepreneurship as well. Uh, There, there really isn't a cap, you know? Um, Absolutely. Yeah. Like with, with retail pharmacy or community pharmacy, when you work a corporate job, there's a cap of how much that position makes typically, you know? So. No, absolutely. And then the autonomy, not being able to do what you want to do, how you want to do it. That just, mm-hmm. it just, I don't know. It just kills me. Yeah. Yeah. I definitely, I definitely feel you. Um, also, uh, I think it's, I also want to talk about this with you as well. Uh, you have a family, man. How do you balance like your family and uh, the, the, the crazy hours you work? Oh, yeah. So everything's a system. First, you got to get a perfect wife. So that's that's like step number one. And I lost uh, I lost about two or three hundred thousand uh, dollars moving to mm-hmm. Iowa. But two or three hundred thousand for the perfect wife. I assure you that's an investment well made. Um, but, but let me, let me, I'll just take you through my day. Like 4 yeah. 45 AM. I get up, I go to the gym from five to six kickboxing mm-hmm. from six to seven, seven. My wife leaves for work. Seven 45. I drop my kids off eight o'clock. I'm uh, meet with my APPE student nine o'clock. I'm on the way to Newton, Iowa, 10 to a 12. I'm teaching chemistry class. Um, then, uh, 12 to two, I'm teaching another chemistry class at a different campus. Uh, Two to five, I get some work done at work. Um, Five o'clock, I might do another workout, but I'm probably picking up my kids. And then I'm home with my kids from like 5.30 to 7.30 when we put them to bed. And then 7.30 to 7.30 to 7.35, I find out my wife's watching The Bachelor. (laughs) So then then I'm like, all right, well, I'm going to go talk to my man, Kevin Yee. (laughs) <laughs> and uh, on the on a vlog <laughs> and then uh, do it all over again man so oh, man. it's just uh you know you it just it just fits in like you just uh you, you get in a routine and it all works out but i tell you what it doesn't work out as well when you've got uh retail hours i, I really feel for those people and the ones that are working weekends that's brutal do you have any like tips you. for them? <laughs> yeah me yeah <laughs> do you have any tips for people like me then <laughs> <laughs> I I think that retail is a fantastic career if when you're mm. you're starting out and I, that's a tremendous amount of money and I think you can bring a lot of energy and and do a lot of good stuff, but I think that on on a family level it's fundamentally incompatible with being a good parent. Mm. What um just because you don't you can't spend as much time with your kids or the quality of time or what I found what out with it? kids is that there are only certain times that really matter. Um, Mm -hmm. and that's when they go to bed and that's when they get up and that's when they have something important and Mm -hmm. your retail job will not care about those things at all. You might be able to tweak some of them, but Mm -hmm. you're going to miss a lot of things. And every time you miss something, you take something out of that emotional bank account. And every time you make it, you put something in. So if you Mm -hmm. go to a bunch of things and you miss one or two, that's okay. Yeah. But if you become the person that just like, why does your dad never come? Or why does your mom never come? Then your, your job's really killing it. And you know, they're young. So they, they really know, they know that you're there for them or they know that your, your job is more important than them. And, and they're just going to tell you out why, why did, why can't your boss let you come to my thing or something like that? So that's what I really feel bad about is that, community pharmacy was supposed to be all about the community and family and the hours that we work kind of violate that. But, you know, I mean, I think it's a fantastic job when you're into your, you know, when you've got up to a young family, but once the kids are like five or six and start to know, then it's going to get really tough because then they're going to call you out on it. Oh my God. (laughs) Yeah. Sorry, man. I'm not telling you, you gotta, I'm just saying you should get, have plans for five years from now. That's all I'm saying. Yeah, I think that's 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 super important. And I think like a lot of us 
who are actually in the field actually realize that maybe this isn't sustainable like 10, 20 years down the line, you know? So uh, Amazon make a fix everything. <laughs> <laughs> dude, d- yeah, I'm sure you know, like, uh, dude, I heard that Amazon acquired their licenses or something like that. Yeah, they, they picked their cities or they whittled them down and they yeah. might be going to Boston or they might be going to Montgomery County where I'm from in Maryland or I don't know. I can't wait to see where they land. Dude, but when I'm... they land and if they drop a bomb on pharmacy, oh, goodness gracious. <laughs> Who knows what's going to happen? Um, also, the last topic I want to talk about is uh, investing and whatnot. Uh, earlier you said we were talking a little bit about cryptocurrency and stuff like that. Um, what sort of investments do you, do you currently do? Um, so what I found out is that I'm a terrible investor when it comes to the stock market. (laughs) I like to buy high and, uh, sell low. Um, Oh my God. (laughs) So as people panic and get rid of theirs, I get rid of mine and as people are buying and I'll buy, you know, so I found that that wasn't the way to go. So mm-hmm. I want to tell you a story about getting this last house that I just bought. So yeah. I'd been a realtor for a long time. I had some houses. I sold them too soon. Um, you know, I've, I've always tried to time the market and I've always timed it wrong. Uh, I did get the wife, which is perfect. So that worked out, you know, investment wise. But what they want to know is how do I get my first house or how do I get an investment house? Yeah. So what I did was I found a realtor in town. And she is super aggressive in terms of like letting you know when something comes like right up. So Mm -hmm. I did my part, which was getting approved for the loan, Mm -hmm. 20% down. I could move on it really quick. And just to let you know, Central Iowa real estate and Southern California real estate are just, all you have to do is just take one zero off and now you're you're fine. So, (laughs) 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 but there's there's where this, the investment was only 200,000 which is in mm-hmm. Iowa which is you know it's a decent um, uh, rental or whatever but she mm-hmm. called me that morning like hey this house just came on the guy bought it for 5 he's selling it for 2 he had put in like 100 into it cuz he mm-hmm. bought it on a tax sale and so i put it in there were multiple offers on it that day but i was ready with my you know 20% down my 40 grand down and and then uh, I got the house, and so now it's a it's a rental that's you know cash flowing maybe a hundred or two hundred a month, which isn't mm-hmm. a ton. But what I did was I invested in something that I know, and I know real estate because I was in it. So a lot of people are like, "Man, I want to get a real estate career so I can become a real estate agent." But the other thing is, is that when you become a real estate agent, you become really good at finding deals. You become really good at understanding the market. You really become really good at that investment. So I've learned my lesson. I'm just going to pay this one off and then I'll buy another one and I'll pay that one off. But that's my investment strategy now is to uh, to just buy a house. I actually have a pension <laughs> with my what? job now. So I know. Oh right? my God, so that's so old me. school. <laughs> so they, I just put a little away every month and I'm going to get 10 grand a month when I retire. So I hope. <laughs> but no, I, 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 I really think that um, there are always deals in real estate. There's always somebody that has to move. And if you can be patient enough to wait for that deal, and I did, it took almost a year to get the deal. Um, you're going to get this deal and, and the house is worth about 240, 250 and she got it to, for me for 200. So an instant, you know, 40 or 50 grand there and just the equity and then the cash flowing. So it's becoming really good at a specific type of investment. And then being patient enough uh, to wait or with the stock market to just buy all the time and just let it go. So, uh, but yeah, I'm a terrible stock investor. I'm better at real estate. Dude, that's it's like, to- it's like total opposite for me. Like, dude, I'm so scared to do real estate, but I'm like so gung ho with the, with the stock market and whatnot in uh, cryptos. I don't know. I, I should look and see. I, I mean, I had, I bought Ford at two. Um, mm-hmm. A thousand shares of Ford at two dollars, but I also mm-hmm. bought. What was the one that went under Chrysler? Was that the one that that went to zero? I it, don't remember. Yeah, but I bought a thousand of that too, and I completely lost that thousand. Oh so, shit! So yeah, <laughs> you gotta do biotech and drug companies, man. Once you get a <laughs> drug approved, you're like you're good for ten years, man. 
Yeah, yeah. I think if I think if I had known that the the market was going to go from twelve thousand in two thousand eight to twenty six thousand in twenty seven twenty eighteen. Twenty eighteen. Yeah. I, yeah, I think I would have been like, all right, well, let's just go. You know, do this uh, interview at my Boston mansion in my LA. <laughs> No. <laughs> oh man so, yeah but i, I, th- I, I think somebody coming out of school um the the key is to have roommates uh to make sure you watch your cash flow um mm. and then uh when the deal comes though you got to be ready for it yeah and i think it's like not only have roommates but like remember like earlier we were talking about different masterminds and stuff i think about like all the roommates I've had and they've definitely really influenced like my decisions. Like if I didn't live with YouTubers, I would never yeah, done. You we wouldn't YouTubers. be doing this. <laughs> yeah. Right. Uh, or like my friend, my current roommate right now, he's really into investing and he's been teaching me a lot of stuff. And I think there's a lot that you can learn by having really good roommates as well, you know, but um, anyways, Tony, I'm going to start wrapping up. I know it's kind of late on your end, but uh, dude, I like, Thank you so much for coming on to my uh, video slash podcast. I don't know. But um, honestly, it's been so great. I have always like one day I just I just realized I was like, dude, no one's ever interviewed Tony before. Like, why don't I do that? <laughs> you know? Uh, yeah. No, He's like interviewing all my friends. Video. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, no, I, I appreciate uh, I appreciate all the compliments uh, and I. And I got to say that I'm actually jealous of your engagement, but I'm really nervous th- to be on because, you know, if I start seeing, you know, a couple of likes, but then a couple of like thumbs down, like I get really emotional when I see a thumbs down. I'm like, what? What is that? One of my students? Are they mad? Do they get to see in my class? What? So, <laughs> yeah. Well, Tony, thank you for all the the advice, especially for us younger pharmacists. I think it's always great to look someone that's. 20 years down the line and that is really successful so in my yeah. eyes you're you're like you're like that fatherly figure you know my that rich dad my rich dad right over there so <laughs> you know but All thank right. you so much i appreciate it if you guys want right, to follow tony's uh social media and whatnot i'll put it in the description below follow him on his youtube uh and instagram twitter i'll put everything down but hey, hey thanks one again. last thing though oh yeah Before, what's up um on the on Wednesday the thirty first, I'm giving away three free registrations to APHA. So if you got any students that are listening to you, I'm dropping uh, two hundred seventy eight dollars times three. Uh, so we got a little contest that's going to go on till uh, Valentine's Day. So it should be fun. Oh shoot! So I got to edit this video really quick so I can <laughs> release that out <laughs> to you guys. <laughs> Perfect, man. Thank you so much, Tony. Hey, we'll see you. Bye-bye. Bye bye. Bye.